In this presentation, we're going to look at trusses, specifically the finite element formulation uh, to solve trusses. And to do this lecture, you need to prepare a little bit uh, if you want to follow along completely. Go to the lecture materials. The link again is below. And go to the notes folder. Download trusses FE formulation if you want to follow along with the notes or at least have those uh, for you to refer back to later. Uh, also go into the MathCAD folder and download the trusses example. It's empty because it's basically I haven't put anything into it yet, which we're going to do as we work through the example. So then you can save a uh, kind of a full solution of the example that we're doing. All right, so you can go grab those files and come back and we'll be ready to go. All right, so we're looking at trusses. So here's an example of a truss. And these structures are typically classified as trusses or frames, also called frames. And what we're looking at when we say something is a truss or a frame, they have the following characteristics. They're all two force members. There's no bending. So two forces just right along the axial um, piece of our members. They're pin joints, which are good assumptions, uh, even with bolts or welds. And you can see here we have a, a pin joint up here on the left, and we have a roller joint here on the right. And loads are applied at the joints, such as we have here with the 1,000 pounds and the 2,000 pounds. So statically determinate trusses are assumed to be rigid bodies and solve using method of joints and sections. This is something you learn in statics, so relatively something we can do by hand calc uh, relatively easily. Uh, when we look at statically indeterminate trusses, uh, they must be solved by allowing them to displace. Uh, we need some deformable bodies and use geometric constraints or boundary conditions. It's a long, tedious process. But what the advantage is with finite element method is we can solve both statically determined and indeterminate in a very straightforward manner. So that's what we're going to show you here today. So the finite element formulation, uh, this is looking at the direct stiffness method. So we have a two force member here. We've got a force being applied in either direction. And it's going from an initial length, L, to a final length, delta L. And we can look at that. We can find out the stress from the force over the area and the strain from the displaced length over the original length. And so from Hooke's law, we relate the stress to the strain using the modulus. And if we substitute in for the stress and the strain, we get this formulation of f over a equals the modulus times the change of length over the uh, initial length. Solving for the force, we get a over l, and that's, as we looked in the previous lecture, the analogous to our spring, a linear spring. So f is equal to k times a. All right, so our k equivalent for a two-force axial loaded member is a e over l. And now we could substitute um, basically just our k now in for our a over L for our stiffness of our member. So to continue this formulation, we need two frames of reference because we're doing stuff within the member, but then we also have to relate the member to the overall truss or frame that exists. So we're going to have a global coordinate system, which is how we look at the overall structure of all the members. And we'll have the local coordinate system to just one member, to just one uh, piece of our whole system. So let's look at how we're going to have those, because this is a pretty key relationship between these two as we, as we move forward. So looking at the coordinate system, the global coordinate system will be used to define the node locations, where they are in the whole, all the space, uh, element angles, constraints or boundary conditions, external loads, as well as the overall solution displacements that we're going to come up with. And we'll talk through all, and you're going to see all these as we go through the presentation here. The local coordinate system will be used to define individual element behavior and values. So within individual element, we're interested in internal forces, uh, displacements of the element itself, and element uh, stresses. So let's go look at that. Here we go. All right, so here's the overall global system. So you can see global x and y, kind of how we usually represent it. You know, y is vertical, x is horizontal. And we'll have some displacements of our nodes globally. So capital U is used for the global displacement. And of this node, say the J node, uh, one side of our member, and it has both an X and Y component, same thing at the uh, I node on the other end. If we look at the local system, now we're going to look locally to our element. We're going to have the X component be along the axis of our member, and the Y component is in the other direction. So we have the displacement in the X direction in both, at both the uh, J node as well as the I node. And we have this overall angle. Now note this angle, this is pretty key. We're gonna measure this angle from horizontal. 
So we see from horizontal, we go from the global X component, and we go up from there to our local X component. So that's pretty key when we do that jump. So when we look at the example, you'll see that we're going to always go from a horizontal um, angle, start at horizontal, and move up to where the uh, axis of our member is located. So there's a summary of all this, all the notation that'll be on the handoff. If you want to check out there, but you'll catch a lot of it as we go through. All right. So then we have these trig relationships. How does the local coordinates relate to the global coordinates? And so we have this. So if we looked at just the uh, cosine of i sub x, so if we look at the cosine here, which should be this distance, this distance right here. All right, you can see that's how that's part of the the um, global displacement in the uh, x direction, but we are going to also subtract off the sine of the direction here. So if we get look at the sine of ui u, uiy, right, we're going to have this distance here. So obviously not drawn scale. All right. So again, this is theta here. So when we look at this theta, so we this the sine would be this distance right here. Right? But it would be probably down here. So not to scale as probably as much as it should be, but overall you get the sense of where these, these two values are coming from. So we can do this also for the other global coordinates, creating those from the local coordinates. And this is going to be a pretty key thing as we as we look in the next couple uh, slides here. All right. Uh, forces, we can do the same thing. So we have global coordinate system, and we have our global forces at each node, again, broken into components of X and Y. And we can look at the local version of those, again, some theta angle up from horizontal to the uh, local forces being felt by the member. And they have the same trig relationships relating the local forces to the global forces. All right, so we have these uh, displacements, the global displacements, at uh, either node, so node i and node j of our member. And from those, we also have some local displacements, as well as global and local forces. So all of those, again, uh, kind of the notation as uh, we discussed are there.